So this panel is about kind of seeing yourself on screen, especially if you're 50 plus. Um, I'm Madeline DiNono. I have the privilege of serving as the president and CEO of the Gina Davis Institute. And I know you all just heard Gina a little bit, uh, a little bit ago. And I'm going to introduce my illustrious panel. Uh, so with me is Sigrid Thornton, award-winning actor. Uh, and then uh, Sophie Hyde, director, writer, and producer. Rachel Mazza, actor and director. And then with us via Zoom, we have Anusha Zarkesh, casting director extraordinaire. And before we get going, um, as you know, as Gina said, we're, we're data geeks. I thought I would just provide you with some facts. And there's two studies that I'm going to share with you very briefly. The first is a film study and it was funded by the um, UK-based brand Tenna, and this was looking at the top 10 largest grossing films from 2019, so pre-pandemic, from Germany, France, the UK, and the US, and it was only about characters 50 plus. So out of all the characters across all those films from all those countries, female characters over the age of 50 were only 25%. And guess, what was the percentage of leads? Does anyone want to take a wild guess? Five. Zero. Oh, zero. Oh, shit. Zero oh, leads, okay? Uh, so, and they were four times more likely to be senile. They were four times more likely to be shown as homebound. And then my favorite, four times more likely to be feeble. <laughs> So that's the picture that we painted, and two times more likely to be physically unattractive. So that was the global film perspective. And then we had the privilege of doing a study that was funded by the Next 50 Initiative out of the US, and this was looking at broadcast and streaming TV from 2010 through 2020, all right? So 10 years, and 70% of all the characters who are male, who are 50 plus, 81% um, of the leads 50 plus were, were male, and also like 80% of the jobs were held by male 50 plus. So, you know, sometimes we think things are better because Meryl Streep works and Viola Davis works and Judy Dench works, but, but guess what? There's a lot more actors than just those three that we see, you know, over and over again. So I wanted to paint that picture. And because I was talking about characters and actors, my first question is going to go to Sigrid. And I mean, you've had an award-winning career, nearly or more than 70 films and TV shows under your belt. Can you talk about the choices that you made along the way that contributed to your success? One thing I, I might start with, Madeline, is... Um, is to talk about how I got started. As a very young person, I was announcing that I wanted to be an actor. Um, and I remember much later in my life, my mother telling me that it was great that I'd chosen performance work because it was one of the few arenas, my mother having been a, uh, a radical feminist activist in her for most of her life, she said to me it was one of the few arenas where excellence was encouraged in women and for women. It hadn't occurred to me before, but it, it may have affected my choice of, of career in the first place. Um, moving on, I, I guess I've always been, um, uh, you know, I, I, I may I appear as a, a strong, outgoing person. Inside, like a lot of actors, I'm really quite shy. Nevertheless, I want to depict people who, are, who have strength, vitality, um, and who drive the story. Uh, you know, it's, it's much more interesting to be an active participant in the story than to be a passive one, a, 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 a giver <laughs> rather than a receiver, if you like. So I suppose I haven't, and I think that this has unconsciously driven my career decisions right across the board. I make um, decisions about yes or no pretty much on an instinctive basis, but I think that the but that but that active driving force has always been at the fore. Now I've that said I've played you know I I've played some 
sort of fairy tale heroine characters because I've been working for a long time. So I've also kind of covered the gamut of, of I suppose my career has, has moved uh, in a trajectory alongside the so-called Australian film Renaissance, um, which, you know, you might date back to sort of, I don't know, the 60, uh, mid-60s, actually early 70s, uh, maybe even later. But uh, so I've seen a lot of changes, and in the course of my work, I've cha I've played a lot of period heroines. We were talking backstage earlier about you know wearing corsets and the restriction of wearing corsets and performing in a corset. So I've done my share of those roles, but I've always tried to engender those characters with an internal strength, with a with a strength of character that in some ways pushes against the trope, against the stereotype. Uh, that may simply be the way I am as a person because you can't separate one from the other altogether. Um, the actor brings her or his or their imagination to the role. Uh, so no matter what role I've had the pleasure of playing, and most of them I have been a pleasure, I've always tried to bring that, that active, forceful um, uh, uh, trajectory to the role. Thank you so much. So building on driving forces, Rachel, um, over to you. As again, you've had a, a very storied career um, as an actor and a director. Can you talk about driving forces behind your choices and that you've made in terms of your um, acting career? So I started my um anyway, just quickly acknowledging also that we're on uh we're on Jury Woy, we're on country, just pay my respects. Um so I started out uh, growing up in a family of theatre, so my, I'm second generation. My father was the founder, uh, amongst others, here in Melbourne to establish the first black theatre company um, uh, called Nindathana in 1971, Jump, um, and then along I come and my family are now all, all in the theatre. So it kind of, in terms of choice, I always find the word choice. Did I choose it? I, I really, I kind of fell into it. Um, and in terms of choosing the roles, I, it's it, I, I question even that sometimes. It always feels like you get what comes your way and you don't get much say in the matter. And I find, I found myself, you know, there was a handful of great roles um, but not only as a as a, a woman, but being also in this even smaller basket of being an Aboriginal actor, and Aboriginal actors were placed in the in the in the Aboriginal actor basket. After when going through training school, I thought I would be able to play anything and everybody, and the reality of the industry soon put a um, shut that down, and I realised oh I was only going to get offered Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander roles, um, and I very quickly tired of the type of works that were uh, and roles that I was being offered. So um, 10, 15 years, or maybe 20 years, anyway, into the industry, I definitely was at that point and I'd always said to myself when I'm sick of it, um, and then, and when I mean sick of it, it was literally when you're, you're constantly being uh, playing roles that just don't have a badly written uh, and in terms of the Aboriginal th Torres Strait context, white fellas writing black roles usually 99% of the time extremely badly. Um, and then, and then uh, in terms of the roles, the the fiend, I mean, I did get to play a lawyer once, and <laughs> 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 for a moment you kind of you step out of the kind of traditional roles. But otherwise, yeah, there was the domestic abuse woman. Um, anyway, blah blah blah. So I definitely got to the point where I was hella over it and I promised myself that when you get sick of it just do something else and I got to that point um uh, 15 years ago where I went yeah I'm sick of it now I'm gonna do something else <laughs> god damn couldn't think of anything else <laughs> so um I'm, I I uh, fortunately someone came along and said oh well, uh, if you don't want to be in it do you want to direct it a um a local theater company called the torch here, and so began my kind of really exciting progression from becoming an actor, which is the kind of bottom of the food chain is what it always, has always felt like. You're kind of the last one to be um, in that creative process. All those decisions have been made about the work and the interpretation of the work and what, what the work is about and how it should be told. You, you're coming in right at the last end of that process and there's so and in terms of the black context so there's so little time for you to be doing kind of like 
they, they wouldn't have said that and there's no way you would wear that or whatever the context is. Um, so suddenly being a director, oh, I've just moved up a couple of rungs on that creative ladder. Um, and now I'm artistic director of Ilbidgery Theatre, which is based here in Melbourne. We're one of three Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander theatre companies in this country and I've been with a company which has just turned 30 for half of that time. I've been there for 15 years. And so to be at the part of the, the, at the in a position of leadership, creative leadership, um, and determining the work that's made and why we make the work and who we're making the work for. So I have much more um, creative satisfaction in my role now. And hence I stayed in the industry. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you for that. So we're talking about power dynamics. And Anusha, over to you. When we talk about power dynamics and being the casting director and being in control of other people's destinies, can you also talk about how you've been able to advocate or the challenges that you've had in terms of advocating for, say, older actors to get them placed into uh, roles that maybe weren't written for an older actor? Oh, wow, that's so hard to, because um, I am pretty powerless ultimately because we, our work comes and our job comes from casting what's given ultimately. So it depends on what's commissioned, what's being uh, produced and the roles that come, come, come through the ranks. It, you know, interesting enough, sometimes we can advocate for older actors or for especially female older actors and change the roles. We might, you know, suggest a, a role that's been written for a man that could potentially be a female, you know, actor could play that role. But most of the time we, we're pretty powerless in that position in terms of what's been commissioned. And it's rare to see female-driven, female protagonists playing lead roles. And, and weirdly, I was just thinking about all the, when I was growing up or when I was going through working in the business, where, where did I ever see myself or my, I, I come from four generations of single mother, daughter relationships, you know, just from my great grandmother right through to me now having two daughters. And it was Sigrid's sea change, which ultimately reflected, you know, my mother and mother's relationship with, you know, me because it was a single mother, professional woman with children and having to get by and the, and the struggles of all of that. And that's where I come from. So men were sort of redundant ultimately. And <laughs> now I'm working with a lot of female producers, you know, very powerful women in certain networks, in producing pr shows, writers. But ultimately it's what it, the power comes from what's the, the money, following the money trail, you know, who's, who's producing, what networks, what the demographics are and, you know, but then from there on comes the roles and how we can put women in those roles. I mean, it's only recently, I was looking back at all the work that I've been doing recently, and there's probably a handful of female-driven shows like Total Control, where we've got two female protagonists, which is Deb Malman and Rachel Griffiths, and a film that I did called How to Please a Woman, which was about female sexuality and invisibility of women taking control of their lives. And that was, you know, pretty much the end, which was, you know, uh, Harriet Walter and Francis Francis um, O'Connor, but almost most of my, my most of the work that's come my way in the past five years have been male-driven protagonist leads in in both film and television. Unfortunately, well, sorry, that so disappointingly, I have no power really at all. Well, and we know you will use it when you can. Um, so, building on power and control and taking control of your destiny. Uh, Sophie, over to you. Um, again, you've had decades of successful film and television projects. Can you tell us a little bit more about you and your other founders came together to form Closer Productions? Because now you're kind of taking control and the power. And can you talk about that in terms of uh, content or productions that have provided opportunities for older actors? Hmm. Yeah, I can try. <laughs> um, thank you. It's yeah, Closer came together because there was a bunch of us who wanted to make work and um, we were in Adelaide and, and traditionally Adelaide was a place people went to film but people didn't really stay that wanted to be filmmakers uh, or the very rare cases of people like Rolf de Heer. Um, and we came together because we wanted to work out how to create and how to work in a way where we didn't understand an industry, we didn't understand market or how things were driven by the money and, the, and sort of following the path of, of casting and financing internationally so we wanted to just create so 
we all worked across different roles. For the first sort of 10 years of Closer, we kind of shared roles. Um, and a lot of it was about wanting to see people on screen that we felt were underrepresented or excluded from the screen in many ways. And that was kind of, I think, simply because they were the people that we felt that we were missing. Like, we felt that we were seeing what we were seeing on screen wasn't our experience of the world. They weren't the faces, they weren't the bodies, the people, the point of view that we understood, you know? And so we started to try and make those things, a lot of the time sort of starting in documentary, but also um, in increasingly in fiction. Um, and it's interesting as a, as a female uh, director to do that because in many ways without that kind of group, we have a very strong core group and we've all worked very closely together. And the first film that I made as a feature drama was 52 Tuesdays, which we, we was set and shot every Tuesday for a year and we we kind of became filmmakers making it. You know, we, we went through this process. And I think without having that core team that I had, it was very hard for me, even though I'm, as Sigrid said, a very strong and powerful person in some ways, it was very hard for me to say, like, I'm the director, I'm the one that's going to lead this work. Um, I'm, it, my point of view is of interest. And I think if I had come up in any other kind of format, I probably wouldn't have. I needed those people around me who were saying, yeah, mm -hmm. I do want to listen to you. I do believe that you're listening to us in a different way, that you're working in a way that we want to follow, you know. Uh, so we, we kind of came up with that through that. Until I made Good Luck to You, Leo Grant, I'd never thought about um, the idea specifically of, of ageing on screen or of, of the representation of, of an older woman in particular, although I've had a few projects that have had that. Um, Fucking Adelaide had a great matriarchal character and uh, Pamela Ray played that and she's a wild, wonderful woman. <laughs> and, um, and but, but what became really interesting to me when I was sent the script for Good Luck to You, Leo Grant, mm -hmm. um, it was... It was financed already almost and that's because Emma Thompson was in it and so mm -hmm. you need these actors who have got a big enough name to sort of finance a movie to have a role like this do you know a, a, a 60 year old woman who wants to explore her sexuality you know that even that just is very rare to see um, but when I got sent the script there was a real challenge for me in starting to work with them which was that there was this interesting woman and as Emma was, would say she was the woman who would usually be next to the person doing the interesting thing on screen. She would be like someone's grandma, someone's auntie, someone's mum, you know, someone's teacher. She wouldn't even get a name usually in a script. Um, and, and to give her something very interesting to do and allow her to be interesting on screen was great. But the script was very on her side when I first got sent it. It was like almost like we're going to show this woman on screen and therefore she's going to be right and we're going to prove that she's this great, powerful, interesting person. And when I came on, part of the challenge for me was, well, I want her to be challenged. I think that this character is very flawed as well and this character needs another person opposite them who is equally as real, equally as complex, has an internal life and a life and a perspective that can help her shift rather than just someone who's there to achieve her story. So in some ways, it's like as we start to draw this out and want to see real re representation of, of older characters on screen, it has to be complex. It has to be opposite other people who are also not just standing in for the lead character's story, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's really interesting. And, and Sigrid, it builds on to my next question. So we were starting to touch upon tropes and stereotypes. And I think you heard Gina this morning say, you know, she is not a role model. Um, and particularly in Thelma Louise, not role models. Um, and mm. as an actor wanting to play very complex, you know, characters. But for you, are there tropes and stereotypes that you would like to see eradicated from um, entertainment forever and ever? <laughs> from entertainment forever and ever, that's a big one. Perhaps in the context of women on screen who are older, I think Sophie's just touched on quite a few of them, actually. You know, the, the, the grandma, the mother, the auntie, the older, frail person, all of those people, they're stereotypes for a reason, 
but they don't have to be stereotypes. It's, you know, what Sophie also touched on this. The interesting characters are the people who are, we, we all want to be seen, we all want to connect. That's what storytelling actually is about. That's what it's for from since time immemorial, since First Nations. And um, so th what, we're, what we're about is, is in order to tell the story of someone's life and development, you challenge that. That's how people learn. We're learning every day. And just because a person's older or, um, or weaker physically or has some kind of disability or is a person of colour and therefore marginalised, it doesn't mean that, they, um, that they're not learning all the time. It doesn't mean that they're not having the same complex experiences that we all have and it, what we need to shift is this is the idea that um, newness and discovery and freshness is only for the young that discovery and learning is only for the young it's not it's it's for everybody and everybody you know and we are indeed an aging population that's duh so we we need to start to discover not just the sort of wisdom and, you know, the old, and I remember when we were talking um, a, a few days ago, Rachel, talking about the old wise First Nations woman, uh, you know, being a sort of trope you'd like to just piss off altogether. <laughs> and I get that too because, you know, we don't always want to be the wise finished product, which Sophie said she railed against with Emma Thompson. We're not the finished product. We're learning all the time. We are frail. We are flawed. We are just as needy of connection and identification and um, and uh, and love uh, human three dimensional as everybody else <laughs> so let's just see more you know intersectional stuff on screen and tropes yes let's have them but let's break them on the screen you know you that's heard it what's here interesting. you heard it here i yeah. love it i love it love it um, so Rachel, I want to go over to you because we started to talk about you started to talk about tropes and stereotypes, particularly for indigenous women. And I would love for you to talk a little bit more about what you're able to accomplish with the Il Bijiri um, theater in terms of characters, stories. Um, now that you're directing, you're you know in control, and how that is providing more opportunities not only for older female characters but perhaps also the inclusion of more indigenous, uh, unique storylines? The There is no doubt theatre is actually a very different platform to television and film and I think there is much more room for um, for a diversity of voices and, 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 and characters and uh, spectrum of diversity within age and, and culturally. Uh, generally speaking, and interestingly, in this um, in these last couple of days, I was been doing a quick Google just to remind myself where are the great older women roles, the great older films, and God damn, they're hard to find. They're really like all your favourite actors. You go, oh, what's, what's the latest film? And it's you know, in some cases, quite a few years ago before they had a role, and definitely not a main role. Um, but it just as an, an example of a moment where I realised the the great dearth of roles for older women. We've just at in this kind of space that I work in in theatre, one of the one of the arms of the company is is creating work that goes to the community um, and out of the theatres. And it's and it's accessible. It's um no one it, it's free and all of so this one particular project that we've just literally done is called Goodbye Arnie Flo. It's literally three older women on stage uh, who are going through menopause and pre-menopause. <laughs> And, and so here's, you know, you go, oh, okay, you know, on stage these three older women who were incredibly in their bodies, brash, sexy, cheeky, loud, um, very human, um, going through these and, and essentially it's a story of friendship and the kind of other the other themes are we woven through it. But the, what's important is that the central thread is, a, is the very human story of um, you know, navigating relationships, your marriage is broken up, but and ultimately, who's most important is your is your friendships. Anyway, um, but what, I was sitting there going, watching this crowd of uh, we had the the public final public performance three weeks ago, and this room full of people were the men, women, young fellas, older women, everybody in the room was just like completely. You know, wow, this is amazing. And I was just like, what, what's this thing we're feeling? And and for myself, as a, I'm nearly, I'm about to hit 60, I was sitting in that room and I was going, I've actually never seen this. 
I've never seen women my my age on stage standing in their fullness, you know, having fun, being cheeky, being sexy, being intelligent, being completely human. Um, and and I and I, and I it was in that moment I kind of just loved that theatre. We we're, we're able to go there, and I would and I'm yet to see that. Um, as something, but to be celebrated, in, fully celebrated in in our complete, um, uh, yeah, T- to be able to be all of those things: funny, sexy, sassy, um, loving, angry. You know, just the whole gamut. Um, anyway, yeah, I was just like, ah, oh, I, I, I'm, I'm yet to see that celebrated in in on screen, and I, and I definitely. Uh, have found myself many a time going, Should I, am I ready to jump over that fence? Nah, stuff that. <laughs> 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 but um, certainly for myself, um, uh, I'm very aware that the roles that are on offer for my age now and now that I've let my hair grow out and all of that stuff, um, I'm like, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm definitely – uh, having to kind of go, okay, I've got to create the role because it's not out there, and I, and the roles for older Aboriginal women are really woeful. Um, yeah, the sp- spirit woman and whatnot, um, the dying auntie with a hacking cough, and um, <laughs> yeah, nah, <laughs> yeah, nah, <laughs> I'm not doing it. So when I when I've worked out when I've written the role, I'm going to commission a writer. Actually, a play that I did a hundred years ago. Um, with three, well, I was one of them, sorry, two other amazing Aboriginal women, Rhoda Roberts and Lydia Miller, uh, in the premiere stage production of a play called Radiance. Um, We've often joked, it was like we're going to write the play about these same three women but 30, 40 years on. (laughs) Great idea. So we're going to write ourselves the roles. (laughs) Good idea. Bravo. Bravo. So, Anusha, I'm going to go back over to you. Um, We talked a lot about film. We talked about broadcasts. But now they're streaming, and I don't know about all of you, but I can't keep up with all, like, how many streaming platforms am I going to have? Who's going to win? Do you find, from a casting perspective, that streaming offers more opportunities just because there's you have to feed the monster and also perhaps opportunities for older uh, female characters? Are you seeing a difference <laughs> when your cat, she's like, no. No, it makes no difference. And this is the problem, exactly what, you know, what uh, Rachel's been saying. Even the the amount of work that's coming through, and and it's it's tripled the amount of work coming through, it doesn't change the the demographics and what's being commissioned. And that's the sad thing. And and like Rachel said, I want to to see the same things. I want to see my age group having fun, acting, you know, naughtily, badly, in ab fab, please, more of it. But no, it's not true. It's not happening. It's just, and I don't understand why. I think like we've been talking about the invisibility of older women, and I've talked about it with all my friends, anyone that's over 45, are talking about there's a certain, we just don't, we don't exist anymore. We're not sexual beings, therefore we don't exist. And I think... I've known a lot of stories that have come through. I'm, I'm sort of involved in a lot of uh, films that are trying to raise their money, you know, um, with Clara Law, a Chinese filmmaker in Melbourne, you know, three generations of women, grandmother, mother, you know, and, and talking about their relationships and dynamics. But trying to finance the film is almost impossible. So I think there's a lot being written but not being financed, and this is the issue. This is the disconnect. Um, female directors, female writers... But the networks, the the funding, the investors are not thinking that it's a viable option, and that you know not going to put bums on seats, and that's I, that's where the disconnect is. I, I'm seeing myself. And you know what's so interesting is when you think about our global population. I mean, women that are 50 plus are the healthiest and the wealthiest of the world. So when you think about share of pocketbook, share of mind. I mean, tons of discretionary income. It's build it and they will come because they're there. Um, I want to go back um, Mm -hmm. over to you, um, Sophie. Can you talk a little bit about um, Closer Productions and the Unquiet Collective and what you're trying to accomplish there? Mm. Yeah, I will talk about that. I will just say that that 
you know, we can't, we're not going to see more diversity on screen across the board unless we see more di diversity behind the screen. I mean, if you still have mm. sort of 13 to 17% of films being directed by women, so that's 82 to 83, you know, 83 to 88% directed by men still, we just, we, it won't move. And so you, and you know, Anusha's right, like it's, um, it, unless we can get financing for those films, it, it can't change. And that's kind of, and that's, as an audience, that's what we want, right? We just want to see more different stories, different perspectives, real perspectives from people. And that means more different people behind the screens, you know? And, that it, and that's like, then we have to do the job as well of going out and watching those films and caring about who makes them, not just what, who's on the screen, I think, as well. Um, but in terms of Closer and Unquiet, I mean, Unquiet is a impact producing company. So, and it's designed to kind of take films that traditionally have been documentaries, but increasingly will be fiction and, um, and find sort of a way to connect audiences with those films in, in, so that audiences can also become part of sort of social movements. So it's sort of saying there are all these social movements, there are all these great films that can help to like enliven those social movements. Um, how do we do that all together? And part of that is about um, shifting the power dynamic and the control. So Unquiet is uh, the, the team of people there that, that run it have a very strong belief in, in sort of working with the people that are on screen in documentary to tell their stories. So we just made a film called The Dream Life of Georgie Stone, which is on Netflix if you want to watch it. And Georgie gave a speech at the, um, uh, at the press, press club. Thank you. Yesterday, which was amazing. And she's an incredible trans woman and has grown up having to fight to sort of be herself and um, has, has become an incredible activist. And, but to tell that sort of story um, at Unquiet, we don't believe in just going into that life and sort of telling it, but we believe in working with, with Georgie, with her family to tell her story in a very, very strong kind of way of, of handing over the power of her having final say, her having creative control, her having um, ownership as a producer and returns from the film. And, and this, is, this is kind of what's really important in sort of building a collaborative model of filmmaking, which I think changes what we see on screen and I think changes our experience as an audience too. Yeah. That's really yeah, good. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Yeah. And you said it's on Netflix? Yeah, Georgie Stone, it's a half hour doc. It's on Netflix, yeah. Wonderful. Put it on your watch list, everybody. <laughs> um, so Sigrid, I'm gonna go back over to you. We were talking again about uh, tropes and stereotypes and things that we'd like to see. So if someone just said to you, okay, tomorrow, what would your next role be? What would you like to play? I mean, what are the <laughs> kinds of stories that you'd like to see yourself embody? I have a role coming up with the Sydney Theatre Company, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, Partly because it's it's our Cardina in um, in the Chekhov's The Seagull, uh, and this character is uh, uh, a so-called fading actress who her career is sort of on the wane for the very sorts of reasons that even historically we encounter in a Chekhov play uh, that we've been talking about today, um, and she but she is um, raising she she has a son. Uh, it's partly about her relationship with her son and the fractured relationship that she has with him. And it's also the fractured relationship that she has with herself, her own self-confidence um, and, and, and the narcissistic streak that runs through all of those elements. So fantastic complexity. Those are the kinds of roles that I love. I, I'd love to play um, and, and flawed, basically. I, I think that's sort of much more interesting because there's something to, there's something to, sh we are all flawed. We're all, all sort of grappling with the, the child inside, the monster inside, the little bird on one shoulder and the other one on the other. All of those things are, they're the, they're the meat and potatoes of, of good storytelling. Um, I'd love to play Martha in um, <laughs> Who's Afraid of Virgin uh, Virginia Woolf. I just watched it again recently and was reminded of what uh, an absolutely extraordinary piece of work that is from both Taylor and Burton in the film, but also was it uh, Mike Nichols who directed that? Um, just the story of a um, the the deep complexity of a broken marriage, a marriage that 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 has some possibility uh, 
that, that, that sort of has some fragile webs of possibilities still going but that, it has, that has drowned itself in anger and regret and, 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 um, and sort of uh, animosity. Uh, those are the kinds of, and, and these all sound like real sort of downers. I, I, I love comedy as well. I, I just adore comedy. So I would love to play an idiotic, goofy, um, you know, not necessarily dumb and dumber. I'm not going down that path. Something a little bit smarter. But I adore comedy. Uh, and I think that it's also uh, a great connector comedic work. It's, it, it really brings people together. Laughter is something we need so badly right now. But I am also very interested, like Sophie and Rachel actually, I'm really, really interested in furthering um, social uh, connection through storytelling um, and, and furthering um, the, uh, the understanding of uh, minority, not just minority groups, but my minority feelings, uh, human feelings on screen. Uh, those are the things I'd like to explore. Stuff we haven't tried to find, trying to find new stories. Everybody says, oh, you know, there's only seven of them. Well, there are, I mean, we just, even if you look at the, the older women, there are, you look at the statistics and you'll see that there are millions of untold stories about older women that we haven't told yet. So, you know, it's never, it's never ending. We're never, gonna, we're never going to have a real dearth of stories to tell if we tr start to tap into this, these possibilities. Absolutely, and uh, remains to be seen. We'll see some press announcements coming out from Secret, hopefully. <laughs> so, Rachel, I'm going to go back over to you, and we're talking about untold stories and stories that we want to tell and stories that may be coming out from your theater company. So what's next for you, and perhaps is there a film being made out of that wonderful performance that you were just mentioning? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, <coughs> look, to be totally, totally brutally honest, I, I've existed so much in this kind of working in the black theatre space and the, nat and the you know, it, we're, I'm having exactly the same conversation in a, in a kind of black context that we're having now in the, in the context of women. And it's kind of interesting. I'm, I'm being reminded that, hold on, I've got to, I, I live in both camps. Um, but it's absolutely about redressing the narratives that exist about um, us as older women uh, and, and, it, and it, the narrative that I've been, I mean, the, the, the realm that I've been existing in in terms of with Ilbidgery Theatre, there is so that we're kind of countering as theatre makers, as story makers, countering those narratives uh, that, it, that currently exist um, and that, as you said, Anusha, this um, on a personal level, this experience of being invisible. Um, it's quite an extraordinary... Um, like it's actually kind of an, an amazing feeling as well to to not be the the, the the subject of eyes all the time. So there's a there's an aspect of being invisible that's been quite liberating. Um, but but then there's the, the the flip side of that, which is of course, um, hello. <laughs> uh, and yet I I'm very aware that I've I've I'm not in the gawking eyes category anymore, which I'm quite enjoying. And actually I'm quietly uh, so much more powerful than I've ever been and and deeply um, uh, much more confident than I've ever been. Like I'm loving the who I am now and I, I kind of wish I knew that about me 30 years ago when I was so much more worried <coughs> about my goddamn body and bullshit. Um, am I allowed to say that? Anyway, um, <laughs> you just did. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Beep. Um, uh, so... I'm really interested after this conversation actually to be thinking because that and you know what have we got coming up I, I'm just, the, it's a story about is the is it one of Australia's most iconic Aboriginal bands it's all men 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 yeah. um in the Warumpi, Warumpi band um uh, the other uh the other story that we've got touring at the moment and is about to do uh rising festival coming up is tracker which is about uh another male story Interestingly, though, cast by a woman. Um, uh, we've cast the play. Um, it's, it's one actor and three dancers and it's about a Rudgery tracker called Alec Riley. And so we've done Sydney Festival 
um, Perth Festival, Adelaide Festival, and now coming back to Melbourne Festival. Um, and what we discovered, interestingly enough, but not, not she's not an, a woman over 50, but it was absolutely interesting to kind of go, that role could be played by anyone. Mm-hmm. It's the it's the, the the role of the person on this journey of tr- discovering who their what the, who their story is and ha- what their connection to this story is of their great great and the connection to the country where they come from. Um, so all of those kind of themes about where is home, where do I belong, who is my community. Um, so I, I am I'm definitely following on from this conversation. Okay, where's the next woman's story? <laughs> um, yeah, it's um. Yeah, uh, aside from this kind of amazing um, experience that I've just had seeing these sassy, awesome, you know, women on stage in all their glory. Like I think there needs to be a movie yeah, or a series good, or something. It? What do you think? Yes. Right? <laughs> well, I want to watch and when that. You, and when you reminded us that actually we are um, – I'm – very comfortable in my life in terms of my, I've paid off my mortgage and I'm financially in a position. And we're a, we're a big chunk of the audience. Mm-hmm. Like Indeed. so, when we're talking about is it are these films are these roles getting bums on seats? I was like, we make up a good chunk of the audience. There you go. So there's our bums on seats. Let's yeah. bring our bums along and, <laughs> and see ourselves reflected up on screen. There you go. Yeah. No. There's absolutely. Um, and it's and I, I can't help thinking it's about who's sitting in the seats of, you know, those seats power. of power. That's the right. The directors and the producers are not are not seeing the opportunity because we've had a massive kind of small but massive shift in terms of the appetite and the 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 sector as a whole has kind of progressed quite a way in in terms of this country in uh, in growing demand for black theatre, and that shift has only happened in this last decade or so. Right. But it's massive. Yeah, it's huge. Right. And there isn't a festival now that doesn't have black work and mm-hmm. they know that it needs to be directed by a black follower, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's been a massive shift. Mm-hmm. It hasn't happened for older women yet. But it's not to say that it can't. But it's going to happen in this room, got, right? Well, there are 300 right people right in here now. or so? <laughs> it doesn't happen by itself because let's let's face it, look who's in power, you know. it's, uh, it's it, you gotta, We've got to just make it happen. So Anusha, I mean, you also have a role, a leadership role with the Casting Guild of America. So in what are priorities in terms of what is the mm-hmm. guild trying to do is the, uh, you know, opportunities for actors 50 plus? Is that an initiative coming out of the guild? And, and what's next for you? Yes, it is. Um, it's funny because we're actually talking about initiative with the Benevolent Fund and the union talking to to look after older actors who, particularly since COVID, doing self-tests, um, getting them technically savvy, supporting older actors on how to do all that and maybe getting a group of people that can help and volunteer to teach um, technically a- actors to self-test, to get the skills up uh, and run by the Benevolent Fund. And so there's a lot of uh, thought around casting directors helping activate that because I think self-testing is not going away now. It gives a great, a lot more opportunity to actors in that sense. So, yes, we're well aware of the technical issues with older actors and getting them much more technically savvy and seen <coughs> and not and by the wayside, particularly with social media and, you know, self-testing in particular. I think that's, I, we're part of the sort of the casting guild of, the, of internationally too. I'm, I'm Theo McLeod and I have been talking to a lot of casting directors from, we have the same issues everywhere. So we're discussing that at great length, particularly with um, diversity on screen as well, inclusion. I mean, I agree with you totally, Rachel, the same thing, you know, I am obviously do a lot of work with the Indigenous community, Blackfellow Films and Bunyur and, I think we're they're seeing a lot more work in that way. But in terms of older actors and, and older female stories, um, it's not shifting either. And I'm too have paid my mortgage off. I'm much more powerful than myself. We we pay the tickets, we pay the bums on seats. So I think we have to become very political now as a group of women or group of people over 50 or over 45 uh, to now advocate for all of those and say, we want to see ourselves reflected on screen. You know, me being a sort of a brown skin, you know, outsider, I've always been on the outside and I've got one foot in and one foot out. 
So I, I, I constantly are saying we need to be much more vocal and much more powerful and much more political uh, and demand what we see on screen. And I think the, the streamers, unfortunately, talk about demographics all the time. You know, the demographics are 25 to 45. They sort of talk in that, you know, when they're talking to me, they say, that's our audience, therefore cast accordingly. And so then the writers and the producers and the directors all kind of adhere to that. So I think we've got to push back on that and say, well, we want to see ourselves reflected on screen a lot more because we're paying the bills. We've got the money. We are independent women and therefore we should see ourselves on screen and demand for it. Yeah, there's a lot of mythology there. We had done a study, um, uh, which I, th I think I had mentioned, um, where we looked at the uh, largest grossing films out of the US from 2007 to 2017. And female-centric films generated 55% more at the box office. And films with diverse colleagues generated the most money. So there is the business imperative. And there's the power of the purse. And there's also power of viewership. So uh, all everybody pretty much so has some type of social media or demand that your children be your social uh, media people and, and use your voice. So before we will, we will have time for one question, but Sophie, over to you in terms of what's next. I'm just sitting here thinking that though that, that those of us that were not raised as men, you know, we were raised on a, a, a diet of, of male experience. So we still are used to seeing a male experience as and mm. relating to it. And, and we still go and see those films because we, we see ourselves there in a middle-aged man who's in love with a young woman. I mean, we sort of have learned how to relate, you know. And, um, and we do have to, if, you know, I think there are film clubs all over the country with women meeting every Monday night, you know, going to see films. But they would be seeing all sorts of films, which is great. But maybe the shift can be just like, let's see female-led films, you know, films by female filmmakers. Because <clears throat> you have to sort of change your palate. If you're fed the same thing over and over, you don't have a, flavor, a taste for something exactly. else. So you do have to sort of shift it. I mean, what's next for me personally? Uh, I have a couple of films and, and um, they all have a, a great deal of gender diversity in them. And I don't know which one will go. One's set in Mexico about a woman there. One's about Constance Wilde, Oscar Wilde's wife, which will be really interesting. And, um, and one is a, a, a story, intergenerational queer story, that's sort of based on my family. So um, with three generations in one family. Um, so I don't know. We'll that's see. That's exciting. Yeah. It's exciting. <laughs> I hope you stay in your seats for the next panel, which is about bodies on screen. And I want to thank Anusha and Sigrid and Sophie and Rachel, um, and thank all of you for listening. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>